And so, Jesus, we sing to you and we sing to each other, lay it all down. And you know that we don't. <laughs> and the hardest thing to lay down is ourselves, the ones that are supposed to lay it down. But I thank you that you have the capacity, Lord God, to lay us down. And that's exactly what you're doing. But even more than that, I thank you that you have the capacity after you have laid us down to raise us up. And I thank you that that is what you're doing. So, Lord God, I thank you that you're good. And I thank you that you do that with your word. And so, God, I pray that we would preach your word or even better, maybe that your word would preach us this morning. It's in his name, the name of Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. Um, this week, hey Kevin, it's good to see you. This week's sermon is uh, a continuation of last week's sermon, okay? And last week we ended with uh, Giuseppe Panisi, who with his crew had dropped their nets into the deep Pacific Ocean, fishing for rock cod and soul just southwest of San Francisco in 1992, when all at once he found himself and his crew wrestling for their life as they were being dragged backward out into the sea, down into the abyss by something that they had caught in their fishing nets or that had caught them with their fishing nets. After a frantic call to the Coast Guard, the wrestling suddenly stopped. And then Giuseppe and his crew watched as the USS Parch nuclear attack submarine virtual Armageddon machine surfaced right next to their fishing boat. Anyway, last week we said that we're all a bit like Giuseppe. We're all fishing for a blessing and we all get a blessing, but the blessing is just more than we bargain for. It's not a small blessing. In the end, we discover that it's the blessing that has actually always been fishing for us. We're all Jacob, and we're all wrestling the blessing. Remember that Jacob, which means heel grabber, supplanter, or cheat, cheated his twin brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing. The birthright and the blessing of the firstborn. When Jacob discovers that Esau... Uh, intends to kill him, for Esau has found out what Jacob has done, Jacob flees to Paddan Aram in modern-day Iraq or maybe Syria to live with his uncle Laban. At Bethel, on his way to Paddan Aram, Jacob has a dream in which God promises to bless Jacob with what is effectively all the promises to Abraham, which includes descendants as numerous as the stars of the heaven and as numerous as the grains of sand by the sea. Jacob had thought that he had stolen the blessing, you remember, and in Paddan Aram, it seems that he tries to create the blessing. You remember the story with two wives, two slave girls, basically this fertility contest, and it seems to be working. It seems to be working until he's cheated by his uncle Laban and flees from Laban toward the promised land because God had told him to go and promises to be with him. But at the edge of the promised land, he gets word that Esau is coming with 400 men, that is, an army. In Genesis 32, 9, he prays saying, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Hiafe, Lord, who said to me, return to your country and I will do you good. Please deliver me from Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers and the children. But you said, you said, it's your word, you said, I will surely do you good and make, you see, make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That night, and all alone, like we talked about last week, Jacob wrestles the God-man and prevails, or perhaps endures, can be translated both ways. He wrestles, and it makes sense to me that he wrestles, because I think Jacob is profoundly angry. <laughs> Maybe like you, a lot like, like me. God had promised the blessing. 
And Jacob had done everything to secure that blessing, including stealing it from the firstborn and then trying to create it in pot and aram with hard work, two wives and two slave girls. God had promised the blessing with his word. And yet, through all the circumstances in Jacob's life, God had made it impossible for Jacob to achieve that blessing. And now God shows up in the form of a man and starts wrestling him (laughs) in the dirt and the dust from which he was created in the first place. Jacob prevails until the God-man, the the firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead, until the God-man dislocates his hip. The the God-man let him prevail, and, and at that all that clinging, defeated Jacob can do is beg for a blessing. Beg for a blessing. You see, Jacob cannot receive the blessing if he thinks he stole the blessing or earned the blessing or created the blessing, for the blessing is grace. And it's just far too large for the illusion of one man's ego. The blessing is God. And all things with him. So the God man blesses Jacob saying no longer shall you be called Jacob but Israel for you have wrestled with God and man and prevailed. The blessing is God and all things with him including the new Jacob. Which destroys the old Jacob. That is Jacob's ego. And so it turns out that the firstborn not Esau but Jesus does kill Jacob, and so saves Jacob from Jacob. In other words, Jacob loses his life and and finds it. And then Jacob, who is now Israel, limps his way into the promised land. Last week we noticed that we're all Jacob. And Jacob is Adam, and this is the blessing. The eschatos, Adam. The ultimate Adam, perfected man, the good in flesh, and the life eternal hanging on a tree in the middle of the garden. This is the God-man, Jesus. This is our big brother, right? And our twin in the womb. To him belongs the birthright and the blessing. I think the birthright is something like all things, and and the blessing is the will of God, the judgment of God. I, I think it's love. To him belongs the birthright and the blessing, And each of us has attempted to steal the birthright and the blessing. It's called sin. And each of us has fled to the far country. It's where we spend most of our time these days. And each of us has tried to use knowledge of him to bless ourselves here and hopefully, you know, earn his blessings there. It's called self-righteousness and ego and just more and more sin. And yet, he's calling each of us home. And each of us now finds ourselves wrestling. For at the edge of Eden, there's a flaming sword, and each of us must lose our life to find it, and he gives each one of us a new name. And it turns out that he longs, turns out that he longs to bless us with his own blessing. He longs to bless us far more than any of us can conceive of being blessed or even begin to bless ourselves. So listen closely. All of your problems, all of your problems have to do with the fact that your Father in heaven is bound and determined to bless you with himself and all things with himself, including your new self, which is him in you and you in him. He's wrestling the hell out of you and his kingdom into you. I mean, just look at us. We're all dying. And so we're all wrestling for our lives. Aren't we? That's why you pay so much for health insurance. (laughs) But this is the good news. Even though we do wrestle against principalities and powers and the rural rulers of this present darkness, in the end we only truly wrestle with the God-man. For all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto him. Done deal. 
I don't know how you feel about wrestling. In eighth grade, I hated it more than anything in the world. I uh, joined the wrestling team in 1974 at Grant Junior High School because I wanted, to, I wanted to make a name for myself. And I wanted to become a man. I still remember the greatest compliment that my coach ever uh, gave to me that, that year for and I remember because it was obviously it was just trying so hard to encourage me. I mean, at the end of the match, I remember he said, Wow, Peter, you held off that pin longer than you ever have. Be- you held off that pin for an entire minute. Good job. Every time I wrestled, I got pinned. I hated wrestling. Last week, I told you that as a child, my favorite thing in all the world was wrestling. My dad. And every time I wrestled him, I also, I got pinned. But you see, I didn't wrestle to make a name for myself and become a man. I wrestled because I loved my dad, and every time he pinned me, he blessed me with his love and his kisses. He gave me my name. And he made me a man. It makes all the difference in the world to know who it is that you're you're wrestling. Last week I said that your father wrestles you in at least three ways. Number one, through all the circumstances in which you find yourself. Number two, the word that he speaks into yourself. And number three, the God man. And I said this week we talk about number two, the word. Um, The word is just an utterly fascinating topic in Scripture, throughout Scripture, beginning to end. The whole thing is really the story of the Word. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God speaks everything that's anything into existence with His Word, Debar in in Hebrew. In fact, in Hebrew, Debar also means thing or event or circumstance. In, In Hebrew, words matter because they literally are Matter, it's the same word, debar. In Greek, debar is translated with the word logos, which is where we get our word logic or, or reason. The word of God is the communication of God, which is the very ground of all being, doing, and thinking. In the beginning was the word, the logos, writes John in John 1. And the word was God, and the word was with, or the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made. That which has been made was life in him, and the life is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it or comprehend it. In Genesis 15:1, we meet this word for the first time. After these things. Genesis 15, 1, Debar, after these words, after the Debar, after these things, the word Debar, thing of the Lord, the thing of Yahweh, came to Abram in a vision. So he sees this word. Verse 4, and behold, look, see, the word of the Lord came to him. Verse 5, and he, the word of the Lord, brought him, Abram, outside and said, look, 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 Abram, toward heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he, the word of Yahweh, said to him, so shall your seed, your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. He believed Yahweh, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Do you see the word of Yahweh is Yahweh, and at the same time appears to be A man that can walk Abram outside and say, Abram, look, look at the stars, count them. I find that utterly fascinating. And even more fascinating due to the fact that when this happened, well, this happened before words could even be written down. In Abraham's day, every word was effectively living, right? Because every word had to be spoken by a living person. Before 1500 B.C. or so, people drew pictures, but they couldn't write words because according to philologists and historians, the alphabet had not yet been invented. For it was around that time, 1500 B.C., that the alphabet first appeared somewhere in the Middle East near Israel. And that's interesting because it was around that time, 1500 B.C., 1700 B.C., that God wrote 
his word on stone for the children of Israel. We call it the law or the Ten Commandments. And check this out. After God wrote his word in stone, he commanded Moses to place that word in a coffin. In Hebrew, aron, which can also be translated ark. The Israelites were to carry this coffin to the promised land. And on top of this ark, Moses was to make a mercy seat. That is, a throne. It seems that the dead word of God is the law. And the living word of God is the judge, having risen from his coffin. In John 1.14, we learn that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, the word of God is the God-man, Jesus. In John 5, he says to the Jews who were, quote, seeking to kill him, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, and it's they that bear witness to me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You see, religious people often prefer dead law to living Lord. And so we all crucified the word on a tree in a garden at the edge of space and time. But it's not as if law and Scripture don't matter. For in John 10, Jesus, the God-man, says this, Scripture cannot be broken. So Scripture isn't the living word, and yet in places, Jesus quotes Scripture and then refers to it as the word, the word of God. So it seems that Scripture can be dead to you if all it is to you is ink on a page or laws in, in a book. You know, that is the knowledge of good and evil that you take and try to apply to your life in order to make yourself in the image of God so that, you know, God might bless you with his eternal life. Scripture can be dead to you, but Scripture can also live in you like a seed that's died in you and then come to life. I suspect that it's wrestled into you, the broken, dirty soil of your heart. I also suspect it's wrestled out of you, like a plant wrestles itself out of the ground, or maybe a baby out of a womb. Rob Bell writes this. Jewish rabbis have a metaphor for wrestling with the biblical text, and that's the story of Jacob wrestling the God-man. Jacob struggles, and it's, it's exhausting and tiring, and in the end, his hip is injured. It hurts, and he walks away limping because when you wrestle with the text, you walk away limping. And some people have no limp because they haven't wrestled. But the ones limping have had an experience with the living God. Now, for Jewish rabbis, that may be a metaphor. But it's more than that for you. The word is all around you, for he is the fabric of reality, every circumstance. The word is spoken into you, sometimes even as scripture, and the word is the God-man, who often likes to wrestle. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please, Tell me your name. Jacob didn't know his name. But, but you do. Christ is not his name. That's a title. It means the anointed. Jesus is his name. And that means Yahweh is salvation. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? A name is, is a word, and why do we name things? 
Well, often it's to have power over things, right? We often call that science or maybe religion. But this is a thing, it's a word that names us, verse 29. But the God-man said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. In the place where he did not know, but he wrestled. Several times people have come to me and said something like this. Peter, I love Jesus, and I love your preaching, but I'm scared to read the Bible, and so I don't. Silently I think, oh man, that is sad. I bet, I, I bet that you've let others tell you what the Bible means. And now you're no longer wrestling for you don't know who it is that you're wrestling and who it is that will help you wrestle. I cannot wrestle for you. A commentary can't wrestle for you. No, no mere man can do your wrestling for you. And yet I believe that the word in you, that is Jesus in you, that is the divine in you, that is the truth in you, I believe that the word in you will help you wrestle the word in Scripture because it's the same God. And when you wrestle with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, if you hang on, even when it feels like there's nothing left of you to hang on with, if you hang on, He will bless you. Just as if you went to the cross and watched Him die, as you felt yourself die, only to discover Him standing right there in front of you on Easter morning telling you that His dad is your dad and together you will inherit all things. I can't wrestle for you. And yet I can wrestle alongside of you and by the grace of God, even give you some wrestling tips and even a couple of moves. So if you would have me as your wrestling coach, who also wrestles, okay, so I have to wrestle too, who also wrestles, I do have some tips for folks like us living at the beginning of the, what is this, the 21st century, I think? Number one, Venture to believe that God wrote the Bible with broken people. As my old friend Duncan Sprague used to like to say, God dra draws straight lines with crooked sticks. We have actually nothing, you know, that Jesus himself wrote. And the only thing that we know God himself wrote was written in stone and was last seen in an ark, which is a coffin, and has now been lost. And yet, Jesus' friends... Uh, wrote about Jesus and they recorded his words in the Bible. And it's clear from those words that Jesus himself viewed the words of the Old Testament as the authoritative, authoritative written witness about himself or to himself. And he viewed his own words as equally authoritative. So, believing that God wrote the Bible with broken people is taking the Bible on its own terms. And actually, very few people do that. Number two, venture to believe all of it. The whole story, beginning to end. The whole story, beginning to end, and the way in between is called the plot. According to the Bible, Jesus is the beginning and the end and the way, and the way in between. So Jesus is the logos, which means the meaning, and is the plot. And so Jesus, God is salvation, is the plot, and me is salvation, is the anti-plot. If you read scripture assuming that you can save yourself, it will rip you apart. And you will rip it apart. But if you read scripture, I mean, let me say too, it will rip you apart, you, but even that is part of the plot, right? But if you read Scripture venturing to believe that God is salvation, it or he, the plot, he will put you back together. And all of it will begin to make sense. That is, you must let the Word of God in Scripture make sense of you if you ever hope to make sense of the Word of God in Scripture. In the second century, a fellow named Marcion 
uh, began to teach that the God of Jesus in the Gospels and Paul's epistles, basically the New Testament, was a different God than the God of the Old Testament, which is an enticing view, and it's still quite popular today, even among people that share a similar kind of hope that we do. But it only reveals that those people haven't wrestled. Because Jesus and Paul constantly quote the Old Testament. And Jesus' name, Yeshua, uh, literally means Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is salvation, the God of the New Testament. If you venture to believe the whole story beginning to end, I think you will die with Jesus, and you will rise with Jesus madly and thoroughly in love with his father and your father. And that, my friends, is the plot. The Bible contains numerous plot summaries, like, look, I make all things new. All, that's the whole story right there. The plot in a sentence, I make all things new. As in Adam, all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. That's, that's the plot. Or God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Number three, venture to believe God's judgment, Jesus, rather than your own judgment, Mises. <laughs> right after Paul writes Romans eleven thirty two, 32, God consigned all to disobedience they may have mercy on all, which is what? A plot summary, and it's also a judgment, right? That's God's decision. God, God consigned all to disobedience they may have mercy on all. He writes Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. And so what do we do? We each assume that we are our own Savior. We each assume that we are salvation, and so we assume that we can understand his ways and search out his judgments. So then with our judgment, we judge God's judgment. We judge God's revealed judgment to consign all to disobedience in order to have mercy on all. We judge God's judgment and say, that's impossible. When I think with Mises, I have to ignore or explain away all of the plot summaries in Scripture. Liberals do that by turning most of Scripture into a metaphor. Conservatives do that by turning most of Scripture into law. So both say, well, you can't take those verses literally. <laughs> when I think with Mises, I have to throw out all the plot summaries. But when I think with Jesus, God's judgment, I don't have to throw out any plot summaries. And all the other passages of Scripture, when I wrestle with them, they, well, they start to fit. When I think with Mises, I don't have to lose any Scripture. But I do have to lose myself. <laughs> Actually, I crucify Mises and meet Jesus. That is, Jacob dies. And Israel begins to live. Number four, venture to believe Jesus, the meaning, but doubt your perception of space and time. Science is our perception of space and time. And I just love science. But 20th century science revealed that there is something even more real than space and time, and that is our perception. In other words, there's something in you and there's something beyond the Big Bang that is more real than space and time. Christians believe that that thing is God and his thing, his word. But sadly, most Christians are stuck in 19th century science, which is actually terrible science and even worse philosophy and not the view of modern science or the authors of the Bible. And so, for instance, some Christians will just go to the mat defending what they call, for instance, a, a literal 24-hour day uh, in Genesis, even when it's obvious that this is not what day meant for the authors of Genesis. In the first one and a half chapters of the Bible, it's used for three different periods of time. Then other Christians will come along and they'll throw out the whole creation story as simply a metaphor because they also agree with our perception of space and time. And nobody asks, what does it mean? In other words, no one wrestles with the word. They're too busy arguing about dinosaurs on arcs or calendars of the end times to wrestle with the one who hangs on the tree in the garden of their own soul right now. 
the one by whom space and time are constantly spoken into existence according to the Bible. Number five, venture to believe that the word is alive. Don't look in the coffin. Surrender to the one enthroned upon the mercy seat above. If you come to Scripture looking for knowledge of good and evil that you can take and then apply to your life in order to justify yourself before God's judgment, you're crucifying the word. And you're trapping yourself in darkness, death, and insanity. And yet, even that is part of the plot, isn't it? For now, what do you need? A savior. But if you come to Scripture, you come back to Scripture trying to... to if, so if you come to Scripture trying to use it to save yourself, everything will die. But if you come to Scripture seeking your Savior, well, everything will live. If you come to Scripture trying to justify yourself, you will discover that you're evil and no longer alive. But if you come to Scripture looking for the one enthroned on the tree, you'll be justified and discover that you are good and eternally alive. So, so number six, don't read Scripture to change others or even yourself. Surrender to the Word and let the Word use Scripture to change you and all things with you. you. You know, you know this. I mean, you know this because it's what happens whenever you read a good book or you go to a good movie. You surrender to the plot and discover that you are part of the story and everything has changed. Scripture is your story. You're Jacob, and Jacob's story is actually Adam's story, and Adam's story is actually Jesus' story, the eschatos Adam story, and Jesus' story is actually God's story, and God's story is you. It's what you actually are. And what does it all mean? What's the plot? What is God's story? It's you and everything that's anything bound together in love, delighting in God our Father in the eternal seventh day, the finished creation. Number seven, don't cheat, Jacob. Be honest. Be honest with Scripture, and this is the hard one, be honest with yourself. To be honest with Scripture, uh, for that sake, I'd like to teach you some, some moves, but hopefully you watch when I preach and you pick up some of these as you go along. There's too much to say, no time to say it. So I just want to point to a few moves and encourage you to practice them, to learn them, because they're really not that hard, okay? Commentaries, number one. Don't read them until you have wrestled with the Word yourself. Most modern commentaries, in my experience, don't actually believe that God wrote the Bible. Jesus is the plot. God's judgment is true. Space and time are relative to the Logos, and that the Word is alive in you. Most translators also, in my experience, don't believe that. Translations, all translations necessarily contain interpretation because there's no, and you know this if you know languages, there's no one-to-one -one equivalence between words in different languages. So it's best to look at several translations while being aware of what each one is, and there are different types. Literal translations, like Young's literal translation, will work hard to keep a one-to-one -one equivalency between the English word and the Greek or the Hebrew word, uh, such that a word like Hades, for instance, is translated with the same English word in every sentence of the Bible. That's that's probably not true in your Bible, which leads to just like massive amounts of confusion. Paraphrases like the Living Bible, the Message, the Mirror Bible will try to anticipate the author's intent and translates words and syntax accordingly. And so paraphrases can be more accurate, but they can also be way, 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 way more inaccurate depending on how well, the paraphraser, the translator, anticipated the original intent of the author, which usually has to do with how they perceive uh, the whole gospel. Here in our service, we usually use the English Standard Version, which is like the RSV, NRSV, KJV, NKJV, NAS, and NIV, and it tries to fall somewhere between a paraphrase and a very literal translation. Interlinears are cool, 
Okay, so just remember that if you don't remember anything else from the sermon. Interlinears are cool. Interlinears try to preserve a one-to-one equivalency and give you a dictionary definition of each word in a line under the biblical text while preserving more of the syntax of the original sentence. And now this is so cool. I mean, this is, I think maybe we're at the edge of a reformation because you can find these things just online, like at, like at uh, biblehub.com, and they're often connected through a link to a concordance. A concordance lists every occurrence of any particular word in Scripture so that you can see how it's used in every context. With computers now, this is all just remarkably easy. So let's say you're reading the book of Joshua and you come across Joshua chapter 10, verse 40. Joshua left none remaining but devoted to destruction all that breathed. And you think to yourself, holy crap. Joshua is the Hebrew word for, for Jesus, and the whole story is Jesus' story, and this doesn't sound like Jesus. Well, don't cheat, don't flee, but pray, Jesus, help me. And then start wrestling. In the inner linear, you'll find that devote to destruction is one word, harem in Hebrew, one word, and from our perspective, from our perspective, it often includes destruction. But investigate the word further, and you'll find that it actually means something like devote to Yahweh. Devote to Yahweh is different than devote to destruction, right? Even though it may involve destruction. And if you look in the concordance, you'll find that all nations are to be harem in Isaiah. Isaiah says that. Devoted to Yahweh, which includes Israel and includes you. Literally, all nations are devoted to Yahweh, and literally all nations are blessed through the promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God-man. All things are devoted to, Jesus, to God in Christ Jesus, and in Jesus, Yahweh, God makes all things new. And dang, that changes things, doesn't it? It's the other side of wrestling. So back to wrestling tip number seven. Be honest with Scripture, and then be honest with yourself, for you yourself must also be devoted. At the edge of Eden, which is the promised land, which is the inner sanctuary of the temple, which is the fulfillment of all our deepest longings and desires, there's a wrestler who is a flaming sword, who is the word of God, living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. That's your old man and your new man, your old Adam and your new man, your false self and your true self. As we learned in Romans, each one of us is a child of God, whom God himself has created trapped in a man or a woman that we think that we have created. The Word is the truth who sets us free from our own arrogant, self-centered, self-righteous, self-hating, selfish selves. So listen closely. You cannot arrive at the truth unless you surrender to the truth. In other words, unless you're honest. Dishonest people can know the answers to the questions on a math test. But dishonest people cannot know the truth until they wrestle the truth and surrender to the truth at the edge of the promised land. And number eight, and this is probably everything, remember who it is that you're wrestling. 16 years ago, I had never ever been so excited about the Bible. And from what I could tell, there were like thousands of people really getting excited with me. And yet I knew that there was a handful of people that were not excited with me, but in fact were starting to hate me. And I'd never ever been so aware that Satan always hates me, and especially the word that sometimes rides out on my tongue. Well, it it was easy to conclude at that time that I should use the word to wrestle them. And easy to forget that the word would be using them... (laughs) to wrestle me. About that time, a friend gave me a vision that she had while praying for me, and I've pondered this vision for years and never shared it. June 12, 2007, 10 a.m. I saw you, Peter, 
entering a boxing ring. Then she describes this dimly lit, surreal kind of boxing ring and watching me dance around in circles all alone, throwing punches at the air, uh, harmless. And then she writes, as you move to your left, I saw a belt with a huge front panel. The inscription on the panel said, undefeated. At the same time, I saw a figure enter the ring, sliding under the ropes. He moved unhurriedly towards the belt. With careless ease, he slipped off the robe he wore, tossing it over the ropes. My first thought was, Peter, my brother, you are in deep doo-doo now. It's Jesus. In that same moment, Jesus flooded my mind with joy, peace. He was going to enjoy this. He had come not to beat you up, but to train you, to spar with you. You saw him and did not make a move. He threw a quick left, right jab sequence, followed by a ruthless uppercut. I, I watched the blood fly in slow motion from your face. You sat down hard, stunned. But I could see you were processing that move, learning it. You got up. Peter, you got up. You were ready to go again. She then describes how Jesus gave me directions like, tie your gloves, but I couldn't tie them myself. She continues writing. Again, I hear him speak. Don't rely on the way it looks. Don't judge by what you see. Listen to me alone. He was moving again, circling effortlessly. Instantly, his left arm shot out. You were down again, a huge gash across your cheek, the skin hanging in an uneven flap, showing bone. I think she wrote, you puked, but I cut that out so I wouldn't say it in the sermon. Anyway, he waited. You stood up. He breathed on you, and, and the flap of skin moved back into place and left a scar. It hurt, but it wasn't bleeding. I heard these words, don't be amazed at the fiery ordeal that's taking place to test your quality, as though something strange was happening. God wasn't concerned about changing the situation. He wanted to change you, and he came himself to do it. I watched you move to your right. You tried that first sequence he had shown you. He moved easily, so those punches didn't really land. They grazed him. He let you. Then something changed in you. You started punching him really hard. You moved in close. You had your head in his chest and you were beating on his midsection. I watched your muscles bunch and ripple. You were yelling things into his chest, into his heart. Oh, Peter, you were so very angry. And he just wrapped his huge arms around you. He bowed his head down over yours and started kissing your forehead, kissing your mind, loving you so very intimately. Peace. Peace pouring out of those tender kisses. He will show you the areas of correction with mercy and love. You can yell and scream and punch him because he loves you. You, Peter, just the way you are, you have favor with God. He'll have you ready for this bow. Stop worrying, beloved. Knock the worry out of your life. I, I cannot think of a better description of what I experienced in the next few years than that after she, she gave me that vision I think my theology was correct. <laughs> Excuse me for sniffling. I had the right answers to the questions on the math test. But my psychology, my psycheology, still needs a lot of work. Because I still have a lot of faith in Mises. And definitely not enough in, in Jesus. I still think it's my responsibility to use the word, word to save the church. And so I worry. And then I get angry with God when it seems that God is not helping me save the church. I still think it's my responsibility to use the word to save God's church, but I need to remember it's God's responsibility to speak his word and save me from myself because I'm the church. 
A little while ago, another friend sent me this. Peter, I was praying about the amount of hours you spend each week working on a sermon, your sermon. My first thought was, wow, Peter spends all that time with God. Then my heart was filled with joy. It's hard to explain the emotions that God floods my heart with, but he allows me to experience just a taste, and usually that taste overwhelms me. So if the amount of joy that I was feeling was just a taste, I had an inkling, an inkling of just how great that joy was. I I know we can't see God, but I saw his eyes, and they were twinkling, and I knew he was smiling. God continued, I love it when Peter wrestles with me, but too often he struggles with me instead. Both the wrestling and the struggling will make him tired, but the struggling makes him discouraged. The evil one wants him to be discouraged. I want Peter to wrestle with me and be filled with the same great joy that I feel. When I read that, I knew exactly what it meant. It means that I'm always wrestling my dad. And the worst that can happen is the very best that can happen. He'll pin me down and cover me with all of his kisses. I can't prove that I'm a man. I can't prove to him that I'm a man. He's proving to me that I'm his man, made in his image by the power of his word. And listen closely. My dad is your dad. We have the same dad. So the Father wrestles you with, number one, the circumstances all around you, the manifestation of his word. Number two, his word spoken into you, sometimes even through scripture. And number three, the God-man, our Lord Jesus. You already knew that you were wrestling for your life, didn't you? And you already knew that you were losing, didn't you? You already knew that you were getting older, didn't you? Isn't it good news to know that ultimately this is the one with whom we all are wrestling? And he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. You're wrestling for your life. And he's wrestling to give you his life. He knows who you are. You're not just Jacob. You're Israel. So don't cheat, don't flee. Wrestle, wrestle until you can no longer wrestle, but can only beg him for the blessing, and uh, you will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Lord God, my soul cries cries out from the inside out. And it's even you that's doing the crying. It's even you that's helping me wrestle with our dad. And so, Lord God, it's, it is impossible for me to imagine a greater Savior, to imagine a greater glory, and to think that you desire to give your glory to us. You are good. And so in Jesus' name, through the power of your spirit, Lord God, we say thank you and amen. And so um, there are all sorts of things, of course, we didn't have time for. But if you want to email me and come to Chew the Fat, we can talk about manuscripts, documentary evidence, all sorts of stuff that 
circles you find on YouTube around this book. But by way of benediction, I'll just say the same thing, and that is believe the gospel. And you probably thought that the gospel was this, right? This part. But Jesus thought the gospel was also this part and this part. It's the whole story. And when you get to the end of the whole story, and Jesus is the end according to Scripture, not necessarily the last page of Revelation, but we talked about that. But anyway, um, well, the whole thing changes. And I think you begin to discover, well, this is the absolutely best story a person could possibly ever live or le le read. But that's what I'm also telling you. When you get to the end of your life, I think you're going to turn around. And there are going to be parts of your story that you're like, oh, I was scared to read that page, and I was terrified to read that page. But when you get to the end, you'll discover, oh, this was the best possible story I could have ever lived. And so believe the gospel. You see, I think for the last 1,500 years, we've read the Bible with this unbiblical weight. And that is the idea that our Father in heaven has created some people to endlessly torture them. You just can't find that in here. However, you will find that God will show up at the edge of the promised land and just kick your butt. <laughs> but when that happens, your big brother whispers to you, have courage, just hang in there, ask him for a blessing. And then there's another voice that says to you, run away, run away, run away. Don't run away. Right before my... Um, it was a little bit before my dad died. I remember I was preaching on this verse years ago, and I remember I asked him, he was like, and my dad was like the closest thing to Jesus that I've experienced in the flesh, okay? But I remember I asked him one day, I said, Dad, do you ever think God would just show up and kick the crap out of you? And I remember he paused for a minute, then he smiled, and he says, well, he sure has me. <laughs> but he was smiling. In this world... You get the crap kicked out of you, but you can smile all the way through it because you know who your daddy is, and he loves you more than you can possibly begin to even comprehend. So in the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen.